Welcome to Fair Territory, everyone. Regular season wrap-up, postseason preview. We've got it all for you today. And I want to start with the final weekend, how we got to the 12-team field, some pretty interesting developments in the final days. And let's start with the defending World Series champions. They can't get rid of them. They won't go away. They are the Houston Astros. They've played more postseason games than any team since 2015. And if you think they don't know how to get there, well, they proved you wrong this weekend. The Astros were six and a half games behind the Rangers on June 23rd. Two and a half games behind the Rangers entering the final weekend. Think about that. They were two and a half back. They did hold the tiebreaker. So what happened? The Astros win three straight in Arizona. The Rangers lose three or four to the Mariners. The two teams end up tied with 90 wins. And bingo, the Astros are American League West champions. So what happens here? They get the bye, the first round bye. They don't have to play in the wild card round. And they get to line up their pitching, which is a big thing for them because they're starting pitching beyond Verlander and Framber Valdez is their biggest concern. There's no question about that. One disadvantage you're going to face in the division series is the fact that in the American League this year, there is only one off day during the series. Actually, two off days, I should say. There's an off day after game two and an off day after game four. In the National League, there are off days after games one, two, and four. So effectively, the Braves, for example, can pitch Spencer Strider and Max Fried in four of the five games. Astros can't do that. They'll have Verlander and Valdez for three of the potential five games, and they'll have to scramble to figure out what they're going to do in the other two. That's the one thing I worry about with Houston. But great job by the Astros simply getting to that division title. Obviously, you'd rather have the bye than not. And now the Rangers, good luck to them. They've got to fly all the way cross country to Tampa Bay to play tomorrow on Tuesday to open the wild card round. All right, the Diamondbacks. Now, that's the team I just mentioned, the Astros swept. And yet they get in. They get in despite losing their final three games. They celebrated in the pool at Chase Field. And you get to do that two years after you lose 110 games. Period. So they're sort of backing in, obviously. And because they didn't win Friday night behind Zach Gallon, they had to pitch Merrill Kelly on Saturday. And that compromises them a little bit. They're going to have to go with Brandon Fought in game one, the rookie who has had an inconsistent start to his career. And then you'll have Gallon and Kelly lined up for games two and three. But of course, you might not get to Kelly if you lose the first two. So a little bit of a disadvantage there. But hey, give the Diamondbacks credit. They did get there. And then let's talk about two teams that didn't make it. Two teams that probably are kicking themselves a little bit on this morning after the season ended. Of course, the first of those teams is the Chicago Cubs. And let's look at the Cubs and how it went for them down the stretch. It wasn't good, folks. This is a team that, as you can see, on September 6th, September 6th was 76 and 64. Their playoff odds at that point were 92.4%. They were a near lock. Well, then they go 7 and 15 the rest of the way. 7 and 15. Their bullpen essentially collapsed. They ran out of bullpen arms. They obviously did not play well. The schedule in the final week was tough. Braves and Brewers, I get it. But man, the Cubs couldn't beat out the Marlins. The Cubs had a run differential more than 150 runs better than the Marlins, which shows you uh, the meaning of run differential and how it can be a little bit misleading. And then there are the Mariners. Now, the Mariners had a tougher road entering the final weekend, and they did win three or four. But at the same time, remember this team went 20 and four in August. 20 and four. And let's look at how they performed down the stretch because it wasn't good either. The Mariners on August 28th were 75 and 56. That was the completion of that 20 and four run. Their playoff odds at that point, 86.4%, with a little more than a month remaining. And then from August 29th to September 27th, right leading up to this final series against the Rangers, they lost 17 of 27, went 10 and 17. So even though they had a dramatic win Thursday night with J.P. Crawford's walk-off, two-out, two-run double, and they won three or four to end the season, they had to do more. And it wasn't enough. Ultimately, they fell short. One more thing on the Mariners. On Saturday, we got into a discussion on the broadcast about whether the Mariners would pursue and possibly sign Shohei Otani. 
And Aaron Goldsmith and John Smoltz came down to me, asked me what I thought, and I said, no, the Mariners' ownership has yet to show that it is going to spend big in free agency. And we talked about it a little bit, and that was that. Then after the game, after the Mariners were eliminated, Kyle Raleigh, their starting catcher, really one of their biggest stars and most respected players, had this to say, and it was quite interesting, along the same lines of what I was talking about. Raleigh said, we got to commit to winning. We have to commit to going and getting those players you see other teams going out and getting. Big-time pitchers, big-time hitters. We have to do that to keep up. He's talking specifically about the Rangers. We've done a great job of growing some players here and within the farm system, but sometimes you've got to go out and you have to buy. Amen to what Kyle Raleigh said. The next day he came out and said, hey, I wasn't identifying any of our players specifically, but he said, I am not going to apologize for wanting to win a World Series, nor should he. I wrote about this today in the windup, and you know what? It's good to hear a player come out and say that about his ownership when ownership simply is not spending the way it should. We all know spending is not always the key to success. We get that. But Cal Raleigh is looking at the Texas Rangers across the field and how much they've spent and that they're going to the playoffs, and obviously he's not happy about it. So that wraps up the regular season. We now have the playoff field set. And let's look ahead to the four wild card series. These series are all, of course, two of three, played entirely at the home of the higher seed. Let's start with the bracket. This is the bracket courtesy of CBS Sports. Start on the left side. The Marlins face the Phillies. That will be in Philadelphia. The Diamondbacks against the Brewers. In the American League, you have the Rangers against the Rays, and in what might be the best series, we'll talk about this, the Blue Jays in Minnesota. So I want to start with the Diamondbacks-Brewers series, and this is an interesting series in a lot of ways. The Brewers, of course, are the number three seed in the National League. They have their pitching lined up, Corbin Burns, Brandon Woodruff, Freddie Peralta. That's as good a three as you will see. Maybe Toronto's is as good, but Milwaukee, this is their way to win with those three guys. But the one thing in this series that concerns me with the Brewers is the Diamondbacks' running game. These guys were second in the majors in stolen bases, only to the Reds. And the Brewers, well, let's take a look here. They don't throw out opposing base dealers very well. This is a problem for them. William Contreras, 11 for 88. Victor Caratini, 3 for 47. The team as a whole threw out only 10.4% of the opposing base dealers. That's catcher caught stealings, 10.4%. Now, most teams had this kind of problem this year, but the Brewers were the third worst in the majors. The new rules, as far as the running game, hurt them. And don't put this all on the catchers, by the way. Those three big starters I just mentioned, they don't hold runners very well. Now, the key for the Brewers, you keep the Diamondbacks off base. You don't have to worry about the stolen base. All right, Marlins-Phillies. Now, the Marlins won 84 games. Not a whole lot of games. Now, they might have gotten to 85 if the suspended game was completed, but... Ultimately, they win six fewer games than the Phillies. And people, I'm sure, around the country are asking, uh, how the heck did they do this? Well, let's look at two things, two areas in which the Marlins' season can be explained. The first, well, it comes down to one-run games and their performance in one-run games compared to last year. It was rather amazing what the Marlins did, the turnaround. Last year, 24-40. and 24 and 40, they were 28th in the majors in one run game winning percentage. This year, 33 and 13. That's first. Best winning percentage in one run games. And you might say, well, one run games are partly a reflection of luck. And yes, that's true. Those records are partly a reflection of luck. But the Marlins made a concerted effort this season to get more contact into their lineup. The trade for Luis Arias was, of course, the one thing that really showed what they were trying to do. And for the most part, it worked out better. They're still not a great offensive team. In fact, they're one of the five worst offensive teams in the majors. But they got it done. Now, what's amazing about the Marlins, and I alluded to this earlier, their run differential, well, it's easily the worst of the playoff teams. And it shows you again, run differential isn't all that always. Take a look at this. San Diego Padres, plus 104. Chicago Cubs, plus 96. The Marlins, Minus 55 and run differential. But you know what? Good for them. They got here. They're going to play the Phillies. And in two or three, of course, we all favor the Phillies. But you never know what might happen. Moving on. Blue Jays at Twins. And I love this series. And I love it because we're going to see two excellent rotations. 
Both of these teams, in my view, could emerge as a dark horse because of the quality of their rotations. Blue Jays also have an excellent bullpen. So let's take a look here at the Twins Challenge because this is the storyline of this series for the Minnesota Twins. Will they finally win a postseason game? 18 straight playoff losses. 18 straight. Now, 13 of those were to the Yankees. The Yankees are nowhere to be found this October. That's good for the Twins. The Twins' last postseason victory, October 5th, 2004, that was the first George W. Bush administration. Pretty amazing that it's been that long since the Twins won a postseason game. Finally, as we move on here, let's go to the Rangers-Rays series. This is a series in which we're going to see whether the Rangers' offense can revive. And that's the biggest question with the Rangers right now. In their final six games, they did not hit. This is a team that what they do is hit home runs and walk. They had the best offense in the American League this season. But take a look at what they did in the final six games in Anaheim and in Seattle because it wasn't pretty. They go two and four. They average 2.7 runs per game. And their slash line, rather ugly. 175 batting average, 283 on base percentage, 299 slug. For the Rangers to get back on track in Tampa Bay, second longest flight in the majors they just took, Seattle to Tampa Bay, they're going to have to find their offense again. And it's quite possible they'll do that. We've seen teams flip numerous times this year. All these teams basically have had good runs, bad runs, as teams always do. But the Rangers need to get it together quickly against one of the better pitching staffs you will see in the majors, the Tampa Bay Rays. Time now for the inside dish. This is the part of the show where I go inside a story that I might have written recently or inside a developing trend within the game. Well, it's the end of the regular season. And what happens at the end of the regular season? The developing trend of managers getting fired. Now, Friday on Foul Territory, Scott Braun posed a question to me. He said, all right, I'm going to set the over under for managers getting fired at one and a half. Ken, what will it be, over or under? Easy answer, over. And I felt it was easy because there were so many situations that were in play. Well, sure enough, by the end of the weekend, we hit the over. And we still might get a few more. You never know in this day and age with baseball because once these things get started, sometimes they're hard to stop. Now, the first managerial firing was Gabe Kapler. The second was Buck Showalter with the New York Mets, the Giants, the Mets. Those two teams obviously had disappointing seasons. But these situations were quite different, and I want to go into each in a little bit of depth. Let's start with Kapler, because he was presumed safe maybe a few weeks ago when Giants chairman Greg Johnson came out publicly and said that both Kapler and president of baseball operations Farhan Zaidi would be safe, would return next season. Well, what changed? What changed was the noise around this team, kind of driven by fans, but also by media, grew as this team kind of fell apart. And the noise within the organization grew as well. You saw criticisms from Logan Webb and Mike Yastrzemski, two of the Giants' most respected players, about the team's clubhouse culture, about kind of the way they went about it. Now, nobody was saying directly that Kapler had lost the clubhouse. It was almost more that he didn't have the clubhouse. And it's a different kind of situation. He didn't really police the players. These guys kind of were on their own, and it fell apart. And that's what Logan Webb was talking about. That's what Mike Yastrzemski was talking about. On August 3rd, the Giants were 61-49. and 61-49. and 49, Held the top wild card. They go 18-34 and 34 the rest of the way. They finished the season in their final 34 road games. Last 34 road games, 6-28. and 28. You put it all together... And it was just too much. Now, what's interesting here to me, and what I wrote about last week, if you want to go back to that column in The Athletic, was that you can blame Kapler, and certainly a managerial change here, you can say it's warranted. That's fine. But really, the issue is Farhan Zaidi. And the issue is the way he put together this team, a team that is kind of faceless on the position player side. They've got Logan Webb. Obviously, to lead the pitching staff, he's a Cy Young contender, one of the best pitchers in the game. But they do a lot of platooning, a lot of pinch hitting. It's kind of a tough team for fans to identify with. And it can be hard to watch as well. Not a great defensive club or anything like that. Now, Zaidi has done some really good things there. There's no question about it. 
but they have not gotten the player to replace Buster Posey as their franchise guy. They kind of lack an identity. Now, it's not for lack of effort. Remember, they tried to sign Aaron Judge last offseason. He went to the Yankees. And then they tried to sign Carlos Correa. And, of course, they had the medical issue, which the Mets later had the same problem with. So they were trying. But now you've got a situation where free agents, it's tough to get them to come to San Francisco for whatever reason, whether it's state taxes, whether it's players not liking the politics of California, whatever it might be. They've had a hard time doing that. Giancarlo Stanton, a few years back, rejected a trade to the Giants, also rejected a trade to the Cardinals at that time. So if free agency is not going to be the way you can build your club and get that franchise guy back or the impact guy you want, well, then you're going to have to do some things outside your comfort level, make some trades, trade some of your prospects for better players. Now the heat is on Zaidi. There's no question about it. When you fire the manager, well, then the focus comes back to the head of baseball operations. And in this case, that's Farhan. So we'll see what happens in San Francisco. We'll see what kind of offseason they have. Because right now, the pressure on him entering the final year of his contract has never been greater. Now, with the Mets, much different situation. And it's a much different situation because they're bringing in a new president of baseball operations, David Stearns. And I wrote this last week in my manager's overview, that Stearns essentially had one of two choices here with Buck Showalter. He could have kept Showalter for another year, decided he wanted to assess the organization, kind of look things over, and worry about the manager later. Next year, the Mets have basically signaled is going to be something of a transition year for them. Showalter certainly could have handled the team competently under those conditions and played out the rest of his contract. The other option was the one that Stearns chose, door number two. And that was simply to cut the cord, realizing that Buck Walter was not going to be his long-term manager anyway, and moving on before this could ever really get to the point of being an issue. Now, this was handled sort of indelicately. Buck announced his own departure yesterday in a news conference at City Field. David Stearns wasn't there. He's getting introduced today on Monday. Billy Epler had to give Buck Showalter the news. Billy Epler remains as the general manager. Steve Cohen was the one who addressed the media, the owner. A little weird. But these things rarely go smoothly in any walk of life. When people get fired, it's just always uncomfortable and often awkward. So from that perspective, okay, I didn't love it, but I get it. Now, no one in their right mind would say that Buck Showalter is to blame for what happened to the Mets this year. But I will say this, and John Harper of SNY in a column put it pretty well. This team, this Mets team, when they had everyone together, didn't play like a classic Buck Showalter team. It wasn't as crisp. I don't know why that happened. I don't even know if Showalter knows why that happened. But if you want to look at some things and point to the manager, as some fans and media did throughout the season, you could certainly do that. So Gabe Kapler gone, Buck Showalter gone, Craig Council, I've been writing this for a couple of months. He is the biggest free agent among the managers, and I know Brewers fans don't want to hear that their guy might leave. Well, your guy's not signed. He's a great manager. He's done amazing things with that franchise, and he is a native of Milwaukee, someone with a long history with the team, whose family has a history with the team. His dad worked for the Brewers. Well, the Brewers have to pay him. And if they don't want to pay him, they're not going to pay him like one of the best managers in the game, then I fear, for their sake, that they're going to lose him. Because Craig Council, if you remember, is a pretty strong member of the Players Union. He knows how salaries work. And he wants his due, as most people would in any career. So it's going to be really interesting to see if Stearns brings in Council if Council is willing to go to New York, or if Brewers owner Mark Atanasio steps up and says, you know what, Craig, you deserve this. I want to make you one of the highest paid managers in the game. I want to give the team a greater commitment in terms of payroll going forward. And in which case, if those things happen, Craig Council might very well stay. Time now for Dude and Dork. We're going to do it a little bit differently this week. We're going to do a Dude of the Year to mark the end of the regular season and a Dork of the Year. And then... We'll do our normal thing as well. Dude and Dork of the Week. So first, the Dude of the Year. Actually, it's not going to a person. It's going to something that exists in every stadium now. Something that was introduced this season and actually changed the game dramatically. 
one of the best things baseball has done in a long time. You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the pitch clock. Just look at the time of game, the average time of a nine-inning game, and how much it reduced this season with the introduction of the clock. Last year, 2022, the average time of a nine-inning game, three hours and three minutes. This year, 2023, the average time of a nine-inning game, two hours, 39 minutes. That's a reduction, folks, of 24 minutes. Nothing was lost in this process. The players adjusted. Fans didn't notice a difference in the game itself. It just moved better. It was more entertaining. Obviously something that baseball needed. Credit to Rob Manfred for pushing this through. Credit to Theo Epstein, one of the architects, and everyone else in the Major League Baseball offices, and the players and umpires as well for adapting as well as they did. The dude of the week, and obviously this is a sad one. Heartbreaking news on Sunday Tim Wakefield, passing away at age 57 due to brain cancer. Tim Wakefield was an accomplished pitcher, of course. 200 wins, most innings and starts in Red Sox history. Of course, he became a knuckleballer early in his career, and that changed everything for him. Tim Wakefield, the person, was even better than Tim Wakefield, the pitcher. This is a guy who was one of the first captains, along with Clay Buchholz, of the Jimmy Fund. That's the Cancer Research charitable organization that the Red Sox have been so closely affiliated with for a long time. Tim Wakefield was a winner of the Roberto Clemente Award, and he was a eight-time nominee. I was going to say seven, but no, he was nominated eight times for that award, won at once. He was a guy that was revered by his teammates for his steadiness, for just being a solid individual. And this tells you all you need to know about Tim Wakefield. When he gave up the homer, to Aaron Boone, the decisive homer in Game 7 of the 2003 ALCS. No one got down on him. No one said, get him out of town. He came back, stayed with the Red Sox, remained a great teammate, and just finished a remarkable career. Just tragic news, Tim Wakefield, rest in peace. All right, now, dork of the year. Well, this is an obvious choice because this guy won the award like six different times. And maybe it wasn't six, maybe it was three or four, but he won it a lot. I'm talking about John Fisher, the Oakland A's owner. Now, I'm not going to go through the litany of grievances we all have with John Fisher. The move to Vegas, the way they tanked in Oakland, well, those are enough to qualify him for Dork of the Year. It won them the award a number of times. They did a few other things, too, that got Dork consideration and Dork certification. So John Fisher is the Dork of the Year. Again, I need not say much about this. Dork of the week, well, you're looking at him. A situation occurred in Seattle on Saturday that basically led to the 40,000 people in the ballpark booing me. And what happened was I was doing what we often do before games, especially in the postseason, a hit right before first pitch. I'm talking right as we're going up to first pitch. And in most cases, we time it out so well where nothing is lost, I'm off the field in time, the game starts, nobody even notices. Well, on Saturday, I'm talking, and everyone is waiting. Everyone is waiting for the game to start. The players are looking at me. The fans are looking at me. Something was amiss. So let's take a look, and you can hear in this video the fans starting to get a little restless. And yet here they are for the third straight day trying to clinch a postseason berth. And finally, the Astros. They crushed the Rangers in Arlington in early September. And then they go 2-7 and seven against the Royals and A's, the two worst teams in the majors. Guys, who knows what the final chapter will bring. All right, you saw the umpire, the plate umpire, Trip Gibson, looking at me. That was where the problem came in. I found this out later. Now, obviously, I'm the guy on the field. And yes, I'm taking the hit for this. I understand that. But what apparently happened, and I'm not making excuses, this is apparently what happened, though. Apparently what happened is that Trip Gibson, the plate umpire, was supposed to take a signal from our stage manager on the field. She is signaling to start the game, and then I would walk off and we'd go as we normally do. Apparently he was just looking at me, missed that signal, or ignored it, one or the other, and that is why the problem occurred. To add insult to insult, Later in the game, the Mariners video board, the operator or the camera person comes up to me and says, hey, we're going to put you on the video board. 
Fox is here today. We're going to show it. I'm like, nah, I don't think that's a great idea. The fans are just going to boo again. The guy says, nah, we don't boo here in Seattle. It's all good. They show me on the video board, more boos. Anyway, I'm going to take the responsibility for it. It was me that was on the field talking when the game was supposed to start. Dork of the week, Ken Rosenthal. Keep cool as it cools off by protecting your eyes with a product from our new sponsor, Shady Rays. Now, Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that has a world-class product just as good as the expensive sunglasses that are out there. They have durable frames and extremely clear optics for outdoor adventures. The best part that really separates them is the best protection plan in the industry. If you lose or break your pair, even on day one, Shady Rays will send you a brand new pair with no questions asked. And if you don't love your Shady Rays, you can exchange them for a pair or return them for free within 30 days. So you can buy and wear your Shady Rays with the confidence that they have your back. Shady Rays are giving out their best deal of the season. Go to ShadyRays.com and use the code F-O-U-L for 50% off two plus pairs of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 250,000 people. Time now for Grilling Ken. Let's get to the questions. Which farewell caught Ken's eye? Well, there were some great farewells over the weekend, and actually all of them caught my eye, but a few of them stood out more than others. The first, of course, Joey Votto's ejection. So on brand, so classic. He didn't want to be ejected from what might have been his final game. He hasn't announced his retirement, and he issued an apology on Twitter, but it was hilarious that Votto goes down and goes out arguing with the plate umpire about a ball and strike call. Then Miguel Cabrera, and this one I love. When he came out to first base and stood there alone on the field while the crowd acknowledged him at Comerica Park, that was awesome. Miggy, of course, at first base, again, where it all began for him in Detroit. What a remarkable career, the 3,000 hits, the 500 homers. We can go on and on and on. And that was a really cool send-off, no doubt. Adam Wainwright taking his at bat. I like that one. Zach Greinke, love Zach Greinke, going through the dugout, all smiles. That was cool, too. And finally, Terry Francona, and this might have been my favorite one. When the Guardians players blocked the entrance to the dugout, so Francona could not leave the field, and he had to acknowledge and stay there and bask in the crowd's adulation. Francona, if you followed him at all, he's a guy that always gives credit to his team, doesn't ever want credit for himself. Well, that was a moment when the player said, uh-uh, Tito, you're going out there, you're staying out there, and you're going to get cheered. Fill in the blank. Baseball's Taylor Swift-Travis Kelsey power couple is... Now, mercifully, baseball doesn't have a Taylor Swift situation going on right now, as NFL does. But if you want to go back in time, Marilyn Monroe and Joe DiMaggio, a far better power couple, I might add, than Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. Now, I love Taylor. Actually went to her show at MetLife Stadium and was totally blown away. But this dude, Travis Kelsey, he's setting himself up to be the next guy she burns in a song. Because that's how it... It happens, right? Taylor Swift goes out with a guy. Taylor Swift breaks up with a guy. Taylor Swift writes a song far more critical and far more biting than anything any sports column could ever put together. All right, let's get to the next question. That one's a little silly. Final question. Favorite wild card memory? This is a good one. I've been doing games for Fox for 18 years now. This is my 18th season. And obviously, I've covered a lot of wild card series. We don't do it anymore. This round goes to ESPN. But my favorite is one that I never expected would be my favorite. 2015, Blue Jays versus Texas Rangers. This is a series that I'll admit when we were assigned to that one, I was a little, ah, this is not going to be so good. These teams aren't that sexy. I don't see the real appeal here. The other series that year was Astros Royals. Wasn't that sexy either. But as so often happens in baseball, what you think might happen doesn't happen. I didn't expect a wild series. I didn't expect even a terribly competitive series. I didn't know what was going to happen. This was a great five-game series. And, of course, it was capped off by the Jose Bautista bat flip, which capped off one of the more dramatic games you'll ever see. There was all kinds of stuff going on in Game 5 of the 2015 ALDS between the Rangers and Blue Jays. That was my favorite game. Interviewing Bautista about the bat flip afterward was a blast. The whole thing. Rogers Center just 
erupting the entire game. Just a lot of fun. And it just goes to show you again, sometimes when you think, ah, these aren't the sexiest teams, these aren't the sexiest players, you get some of the best games. It happened that day. Maybe it happens again this postseason. Looking ahead, I will not be working television for this round of the playoffs, but we come in, Fox does, with the division series, and I am going to be working the Orioles series, whoever they end up playing, the Rangers or the Rays. It's going to be really fun for me to go back to Baltimore, where I worked from 1987 to 2000, lived there until 2009. Camden Yards is the park where I've written a ton of columns at. I've done a ton of work at that park, and I love being back there, so I'm really looking forward to doing this series. And I know the Orioles fans are really excited about their team, and they should be. First playoff appearance since 2016, first division title since 2014. The Orioles won 100 games this season. They had a remarkable run, best team in the American League. Thanks to everyone for watching. Thanks to everyone for listening. You know where to find us, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, like us, subscribe, do whatever you need to do. Now, as for the schedule in the postseason, right now the plan is to be back with you a week from today on Monday, but it's the postseason, things change, travel plans, huh, they can change too, as you know. So just stay with us, follow me on Twitter, and I'll tell you exactly when the show is going to air. Hey, get in on the action with the FT fam at BetMGM. New customers use the bonus code FOUL, F-O-U-L, for a $1,500 first bet offer. Download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android or visit BetMGM.com. Sign up and deposit at least $10 into your BetMGM Sportsbook account. Place your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. If that bet does lose, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLING.